good. Last week, we discussed the importance of context for relationships, the need to employ the mind as well as, but not instead of, the heart. Allowing for an internal transcendent height to love allows relationships to flourish in a way that is healthy for futures, disrupting our tendencies to grow too inbred and isolated in a duality that may be increasingly become monolithic. That was last week. This week, we'll look at the implications of temporality in our relationships through a poem that, unlike Shakespeare's, centers on and celebrates the brief span of love enjoyed by bodies. Andrew Marvell's to his quote mistress appears to be a kind of lighthearted literary attempt to engage in the same sort of antics that one might expect in a late night college town bar. Within that context, the perseverance of the book becomes a little creepy, a little jarring. For me, the poem only becomes palatable in the context of its over the top sense of humor. Beneath this, though, I think Marvell strikes a question of love and temporality important to guide us to new ways of unlocking our loneliness. Start out with stanza one, uh, looking at the long lost day. And I'll go through the poem. Happy but world enough in time, this coyness lady bore no crime. We would sit down and think which way to walk and the pass our long loves day. Thou by the Indian Angie's side should screw these fine. I by the tide of hunger would complain. I would love you ten years before the flood, and if you should, if you, you should, if you please, refuse till the conversion of the Jews. My vegetable love should grow faster than empires, no more slow. And a hundred years should go to praise thine eyes, and on thy forehead gaze two hundred to adore each breast, and thirty thousand to the rest. And age at least to every part, and the last age should show your heart. For lady, you deserve this state. Of what I love, the poor rain. So then, the intent of this I think is humor. The poet accuses his lady of coyness and argues that lacking world enough in time, it becomes criminal. He then lists the activities that they could embark on had they world in time enough, and much of his time would be spent adoring the beloved body. The scale that the poet uses, both of world and time, seems part of a more urgent quest to consummate the passion that the poet feels. The complaint, in a lot of ways, is less about the lady than about the unfair ways that time restricts intimacy. The poet cannot treat his lady as she deserves. He cannot offer her the vastness of his heart, the infinite scope of his love. In some ways, I think that more than fair to take the poet seriously as he contemplates what it would do to take, or what it would take to do justice to his love. The lady's collection of charms and beauties is deserving of the poet's infinite ardor and would reward an infinite amount of attention. The first lines provide a model for unlearning loneliness that balances the natural and the rational. The poet begins with an awareness that his lady is worthy of an infinite amount of attention. Although the easy focus in the stanza goes to the contrast between the hundred years from the eyes and the two hundred from the each breast, the import of the stanza is otherwise. The infinite value of the beloved is in two ways. First, the passage of the long love's day is something that requires a vegetable love, something that's planted and requires a time of seeing the dormancy before its fruit develops. The nature of this love is resonatic. It's a series of interconnections that allow the emergence of something vaster than empires. Now, it can transcend the individual moments, spaces, and times to create its own specific world. The nutrient notion of a vegetable love is something that's constructive, something positive, something additive, something nutritive. It transforms what is latent into new life, a life that, in turn, is able to feed and nourish in an inward form. That this is true allows for the infinitely complex, infinitely valuable human being to develop in tandem with another over time. Secondly, Rather than something all-consuming, the way that some of us experience love with different moments, the poet's love is something that's all-encompassing. Its vastness knows no limitations in space or time. Like an empire, it holds itself together through distinct times and ways without losing the sense of the thing that it is. The growth is something that is social and intentional, not just a thing. 
It relates to the relationship, something that's able to transcend discrete parts and elements in order to gather everyone to place and time into a sensible whole that has its own life and personality. In this way, just think of any empire, the Roman Empire, the British Empire, the American Empire, and whatnot, where the goal is to have a sense of identity that transcends any kind of local time or place or orientation. So you have your own local languages that nonetheless are able to participate in a vast revival of any kind of accepts where you're supposed to have pride to be a part of the empire without using that sense of what's local. And I think that's part of what Marvel is pulling to you is that notion of empiric love. It's vast, but in that vastness, nonetheless, it oscillates between a greater whole that transcends the locality without dominating or erasing that locality. Does that make sense? Um, so what Marvel points to is the sense of a relationship that balances the risks of an overly claimed relationship. Something it can lead to, or it's critical to, the overly intellectualized sense of the marriage of two minds. And instead, he wants of something organic, natural, and nurturing. This type of love is one that requires time. And because the beloved is seen as infinitely valuable, one would hope for an infinite amount of time to be spent related to the beloved. Those who have had the fortune of finding the love worthy of an infinite day have also, like Marvell, been met with the disappointment of knowing that such a love is impossible. There's never enough time to love well, or even at the state that the beloved deserves. That's the answer. The second stage that turns from the problem of time is one that demands urgent choices, or turns to looking at the problem of time as being a problem that demands urgent choices from the humans involved in the relationship. Here we go. But at my back, I always hear time's winged chariot pouring in the air. And beyond where all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Thy beauty shall no more be found, nor in thy marble vault shall sound thy echoing song. Then the worms shall try it, that long preserved virginity, and your quaint honor turn to dust, and into ashes all my lust. Praise of graves to find a private place, but none, I think, can bear a grace. But thrown into the world, thrown into a relationship, and the vagaries of life demand that we be mindful that we have a finite amount of time to spend sharing an infinite amount of love. The sensible takeaway of Stanza 2, its most superficial level, uses this fact as a way to hasten sexual progress. The fact that one shall try the long preserved virginity and then the great honor to the dust and add to the ashes on my lust, etc., is a pretty direct description of the poet's intent. But even if the poet's intention is nothing more than one night of common bliss, the motivations for his urgency, I think, are a little bit more complex. The stanza starts with the notion of time's winged chariot. But what's more awful to the poet are the deserts of vast eternity stretching ahead. It's far from the vegetable love that attended the poet in the present moment. The future is not something that lovers have any certainty of exploring. The problem isn't only one that's skin deep. Where the lady's beauty shall no, be found, no more be found, instead, the poet worries of the silence and stillness that attend the end of the time of life. Nor in thy marble vault shall sound my echoing song. The future is an emptiness, and all of the anticipations of maturity of life are living. We're finite beings, and our finitude demands of us that we take certain risks. In many ways, the poet points to the fact that death is the cause of the ultimate loneliness. Problematically, the loneliness inspired by the grave, which again is a fine and private place where none of the things do better grace. It's not something possible for us to learn. We can't unlearn death. Unlearning our loneliness requires that we act while we have life and love, voice and touch. Marvell also, therefore, insists that unlearning our loneliness requires examining those defenses that we have against it. And that's how we, I think we can look and frame questions of honor, the need to protect our physical bodies from sexual intimacy, and to weigh those defenses against the possibilities that yielding to physical consummation might have. This is not to say that we should always have sex with others, and it's definitely not to say that all ladies should yield their quaint honor to well smoking young men who wish to remain their own. Definitely not. Uh, nor is this to say that opening our bodies and becoming vulnerable to physical intimacy is a sufficient way of telling our own loneliness. 
It is to say that our bodies, in time, are a necessary component of our moments. As Aristophanes realized, love requires moments of concretization becoming actualized in the yielding of the flesh. <clears throat> that seems to make sense. Mm -hmm. The third stanza opens a way for humans who are prevented from living longer to begin living deeper. As with the rest, it begins with a superficial request to have sex with a lady, or at least in that line, while, while this person is still young and beautiful. And in contrast to the emphasis on the past provided by stanza one, or the future outlined in stanza two, the poem begins the third stanza with an initial now. Now, therefore, while the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew. It's an allusion to the beginning of the lover's day once again, but this morning is the beginning of a day, not the end of the night. It's an invitation to start a relationship, not an invitation to end one. The poem continues. And while thy willing soul transpires at every pore of instant fires, he marks the importance of the instant. As many of us have realized, love's invitations are really permanent. They're opportunities, but the opportunity that exists in one moment may not exist in the next. Once again, this is not to suggest that we should engage indiscriminately in sexual relationships. Some opportunities are far better to just not have. But the invitation of love, the gentle blow provided by the dawn of love, is something that requires a courage. Any act of love requires courage, and it must be done with consent, with a willing soul, and especially when the soul's will manifests through every pore with instant fires. Imagine true minds may believe that it has an infinity to contemplate the nature of love, but the lover who would unlock his loneliness or her loneliness must contend with the pressures of time. These considerations are not always met with a yes or an embrace of the opportunity. Instead, I think Marvel cautions us to factor time into the way that we consider our relationships. But what Marvel's poet wants seems less a conquest of a maiden and more a deepening of life itself. Again, starting with the now, he continues his poem in a way that commends us to the present, writing, quote, now let, us, now let us sport, us while we may, and now, like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour. The alternative to the endless deserts of the future, or preserving a life not fully lived, is devouring the time that's given to us. It's a question, too, of the lovers day, a question of how much of our time will be spent distant, rather than not locked in the embrace. The loneliness of distance can persist until time is up, of course. We don't have to act on those opportunities. And if we want to, we should do so courageously with all of us. There's a lot of violence that follows the invitation to the youngest parts of prey, but the violence is directed against finitude, not against each other. The poet writes, quote, at once our time devour, at once, and that includes both an insistence on now, as well as the sense that one can consume a lifetime in an instant. To live fully in that moment, not spare oneself. The languish in his slow chapped power is an indication of the time to be as it goes on. It's not something that adds value necessarily. Time is only good when we use it. The poet next to this Aristophanes speech in the symposium, quote, let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball. And this allows the poet to transcend the thought of mere sexual congress to look at the meaning of the act. In this case, it's a way to wage war on the gods that bow us to finite forms severed from another half. And tear our pleasures with rough strife through the iron gates of life. The violence seeks life, not death. To fight for survival. It's the only way, Marvel implies, that humans can fully live. The poet concludes with this quote, Thus, though we cannot make our sun stand still, yet we will make him run. Love becomes a race of life against death. Our finitude forces us to move through time. We can neither pause a moment nor count on a series of them adequate to move through life. What we can do, instead, is look at the ferocious intensity with another, feeding and generating new lives and expanding empires as we do so. Our ardor, our passions, when it unites us to become more than what we are, more than ourselves. 
So overall, the logic for Miller's argument seems to be as follows. One, loneliness is a common trap. Two, physical intimacy is a necessary component to unloading our loneliness. Three, experiencing physical passion is our way to deepen our lives, extending around the axis available to us. We gain more life by plunging into time through love. Four, we learn loneliness and submit to an early death through time's slow chapped powers by resisting the call of our will toward physical intimacy. Once again, I'm aware that I'm extending the poet's plea beyond the pleasure of the moment that he also chiefly mentions. But what appeals to me about this poem is the way that he voices the meaning behind those midnight pursuits, the longing and the surging of life that wishes for more. This sense of more implied by the poem, the actualization of the joy of life, emerges when we manage to wall ourselves into the arms of life and another. It's only at these moments, the poet repeats, that we make time chase us. In understanding this poem, I believe, reopens the first two stanzas of the poem in a new context. The first stanza, the question of world and time, becomes a possibility only when the lovers make the sun chase after them. It does not allow the suspension of love's, love's long day, and it doesn't literalize the question of an age of every part. However, what it does offer is the sense that relationships can sacrifice the security of loneliness for the rough strife of companionship, create a new and intense depth in our temporality. It allows a life open to the possibility of seeing a thousand years within a moment, the literal age of every part of the experience, even if we don't live. It's also a foundation upon which eventually life might grow, upon which an empire might be planned. But it demands physical vulnerability as a foundation. It demands that kind of intimacy. It's not a kind of life that can be left alone. For the perspective of the third stanza and the successful consummation, the issues in the second stanza are negated. The sun's pursuit is a way of the race that the lovers are winning. The focus is on the present. The gates of life that the lovers are uniquely able to enter, and not the dead experience of a future of barren, lonely eternity. There's no need to contemplate death, for life surrounds the lovers. Here are a few implications. Number one, there's a problem with sexual aggression and the assumption that one ought to have sex for its own sake. There is also a problem with timidity and insecurity, which sometimes masks his own unfortunate. Both paths, that of the libertine and that of the chaste, can be paths for loneliness. Unlearning our loneliness, and this is the deepest potential of the poem, requires accepting the space of physicality within a relationship. Number two, the problem in our lives is death. The final answer is infinitude and time to our existence. When we find a lover, time takes on a new meaning. But the potential loss of the beloved in the lonely tomb and the inability to do justice to the beloved during the time that we possess. The answer, for a while though, is to choose life through choosing love. The passions that ignite humans with enjoyment are the ones that allow us access to a physically anchored, passionate life, graced by the intellectual awareness of admiration, poetry, and growth. Permitting physical passion plants the seeds of a vegetable love that can become a timeless, expansive empire. Finally, every love relationship can be summed up within the space of a day. It dawns, grows, and fades. The question of enjoying long love's day requires acting on the initial impulses that lead us even to strange places toward those who come out when we remain uncertain. It requires that we invest physically in the passions that ignite us and work together with another for the kind of life that burns through time. Thank <clears throat> you.